March the 16th. Uh, month is quickly flying by, and before we know it, we'll be into Passion Week, uh, Palm Sunday, and Easter Sunday with our Good Friday service on that Friday preceding Easter. I encourage you to take a look at the website or uh, Sunday morning. Make sure you pay attention to the schedule that's upcoming for that time of the year. I want to encourage you also to invite as many people as you can to be in attendance either Palm Sunday or Easter Sunday. It's a great opportunity to invite people to come to church. They'll typically come on Easter where they won't come any other Sunday of the year. So let's take advantage of that. Let's be praying for that day that God would prick the hearts of, of many with the salvation of Christ. I want to share with you real quick, uh, Sunday evening, we had a young man come to Christ who is a young adult, and um, uh, a number of young adults have been engaged in his life for some time, and just loving on him and sharing Christ with him through their life and in their word, and so we praise God for that. I'm thankful that the Lord is still active and working and, and we're seeing people come to Christ through the body of Christ. Um, Jimmy Casillo uh, had shared with me yesterday when I saw him at Publix, uh, just his, his father's decline. His father had a stroke and he's been bedridden for now about six months. And so uh, let's pray for Jimmy. Just ask God to give him strength and courage as he loves on and cares for his dad. and. If you have an opportunity to reach out to him and just let him know that you're praying for him. A bit of good news, um, uh, Harold Danforth got his results back yesterday from his PET scan and praise God that, uh, that, that there's only one tumor and that is in his spine so they'll be able to treat that with radiation and there's not going to be any chemotherapy required. So just really praising God for that is a real concern and we thank the Lord for that. I want to continue to pray for... Um, uh, for Vanessa, she's undergoing radiation treatment, that God would just give her strength through all this. And, and thank God that um, uh, we, we believe we're seeing that uh, the cancer is gone and uh, the Lord has healed her. I want to pray for Ken Moss and John Moss. Ken is not doing well. I think Ken, uh, the last word that I got, he has septic as well. And so let's be praying for him and reaching out to to Joan and of course there are a number of other requests and some slip my mind right now but be praying for one another if you have a particular prayer request please post that so we can be praying for you and um, let's lift up the body well this morning there was a song that came to my heart and mind not sure if I've ever done it on a morning devotion but uh, you'll be very familiar with the song sweet hour of prayer Sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wounds and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief, and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy burn with strong desire for thy return. With such I hasten to the place where God my Savior shows his face. Take 
my station there and wait for thee, sweet hour of prayer. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often The tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. There's nothing like, there's no other feeling, there's no other gratification than having just sweet time of fellowship and prayer with the Lord. My time this morning was shortened a little bit just because I had was just a little bit behind at home. Um, I didn't have as much time to, to meditate and contemplate on this scripture, but man, the Lord really just met me this morning. And I hope he's met you already, and uh, I hope he meets you through this devotion this morning. And let's pick up in Hebrews chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 14. We have seen now that the writer of Hebrews has shown us that Jesus is better, he's greater than the angels, <clears throat> and that one figure that was so revered and uh, to the Jews, Moses, the, 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 the father, the one that led him, them out of captivity and the one who had been instrumental through God to receive the law and also had recorded the first five books of the law, the Pentateuch for us, they, they revered Moses. And now the writer has shown us that Jesus is better or greater than Moses, uh, that Moses was merely a, a spokesperson, if you will, uh, for what was to come later, the Messiah, Christ. And now Jesus is the fulfillment of all that was given in the law and that was spoken of through Moses. And now the writer is going to turn to show that Jesus is the high priest of God. Uh, in, in the law, there was the provision of the high priest that was a representative of God to the people and a representative of the people to God. He was, if you will, the go-between uh, between the people of Israel, the children of Israel, and God. And so now the writer's going to turn and say, listen, th that was just a temporary high priest that God had put into place. But now there is one that has fulfilled that, has been appointed by God as the high priest. Um, the New Testament says there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, God, Jesus Christ. And so that Old Testament law mediator, the high priest, has now been uh, fulfilled in Christ. And so he begins writing in verse 14 of chapter 4. And a side note, you may wonder why I'm not going chapter by chapter. Uh, it's because the, the chapters and verses were later put into Scripture. They're not the inspired. And so oftentimes the chapters come at places right in the middle of the author's thought process. And so I'm just kind of taking each passage as it would be within, within the, the thought process as the writer was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these things. So don't get messed up if I'm not going chapter by chapter. But verse 14, he says this, Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. And so Jesus, in his ascension, uh, after he was raised from the dead and he was ascended to the Father, he has passed through the heavens, and now he sits at the right hand of God continually making intercession for the people of God. You see, the high priest, the earthly high priest, when he performed his ceremonies of, of the sacrifice within the Holy of Holies, he was making intercession for the people of God, sprinkling the blood over uh, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, and interceding that God would forgive the children of Israel. Uh, but now we have the great high priest, Jesus, who has already passed through the heavens and he himself has entered into the Holy of Holies, the throne of God, and he sits there at the right hand of the Father 
continually making intercession for us. Isn't that good to know? I was, I was, I was thrilled this morning as I read that to, to realize that Jesus is continually sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for JMO, making intercession for you, because I'm not consciously aware of all of my sins. Neither are you. Now, there's something I'm aware of, and there are times that the Holy Spirit will convict me, but there are many sins that you and I commit on a daily basis, a regular basis, an hourly basis, that we're not even cognitive of. And Jesus is forever making intercession for us, pleading his shed blood as an atonement, a payment for our sins, so that we have no fear of entering into the presence of God, which the writer goes on to say. He says, for we do not have a high priest, verse 15, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one has who has in every way been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus, because he became a man, became fully man, he is able to sympathize with us because of our weaknesses, because in every way that we are tempted, Jesus himself has been tempted. He understands, he knows the struggle of temptation that we have, but praise God, yet he was without sin. He was tempted in every single way. Uh, it, it wasn't let up. It wasn't lessened any in his temptation. He was tempted just as much as we are, yet he was without sin. And praise God, he was without sin because he was able to fulfill for us what the first Adam was not able to fulfill in that he was sinless and he was an acceptable means of sacrifice for the atonement of our sin. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that, that there's no temptation that is taken taken us except that which is common to man. But with that temptation, God will provide a way of escape. Now, the fact is, you and I will never attain sinless perfection on this side. But praise God when we are tempted. We have the power of the Holy Spirit that we can overcome temptation. But in those instances, in those times that we fall to temptation, Blessed be to God that Jesus had fulfilled that for us. And in response to that, he says in verse 16, because Jesus has been tempted in every way and he did not fall to sin, and because Jesus is a high priest that, that forever sits there at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us, pleading his blood as an atonement for our sin, that gives reason, as he says in verse 16, then to let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. I don't know about you, but this is what goes through my brain after I know that I have fall into a temptation of sin. I get the idea that I am no longer worthy to come into God's presence. It's, it's as if, you know, man, I've blown it and I've sinned against God. And who am I to, to come into God's presence because I failed to sin? Well, yes, bonehead, you did fall to sin and you will fall to sin. That's to me and that's to every one of us. But there is God has made a way that we can come into his presence. The symbolism there is just like the high priest going into the Holy of Holies. We can come into God's presence after we've blown it and even before we've blown it so we might receive grace and mercy in our time of need. Don't let your pride tell you that you should have lived up to the expectations that you placed on yourself. We need to get real about this. We are sinners and we will always sin. But thanks be to God that Jesus has made us the righteousness of God in Christ positionally and he sits at the right hand of the Father. And because of that, we have access to God, to his throne, to his very presence every single day, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it's because Jesus has done that, that we have a way to have access to the Father. If you're sitting there today, 
thinking that you are worthless, that you have no means to come before the Father. You're right in one sense, in and of yourself. You have no means, you have no right to come before the Father, the throne of God, but because of Jesus Christ and your trust in him and his payment for his sins, folks, we can draw near to him. Somebody say amen to that. I'm going to start preaching in just a minute. But I thank God because I know in myself, man, there is absolutely nothing that gives me worthiness to come into his presence. But through Jesus, I have that. Verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, he goes on to say, For every high priest, that is, in, in, the, in the order, the manly order of high priest, that God had instituted, for every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of man in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. We spoke of this a couple of days ago. That annually, once a year, during that Passover time, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies with the with the spotless with the blood of a spotless lamb and and he would make atonement as a sacrifice a covering for the sins of of the people of Israel the writer's going to go on to say but because he was a man because he was a sinner he first had to make atonement through sacrifice for his own sins he had to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself was beset in weakness that earthly high priest was beset in weakness because he was a sinner also because of this he is obligated to offer sacrifices for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. In other words, it's an appointment. They were called by God to be the high priest. So also, verse 6, or verse 5, so also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but he was appointed by him who said, you are my son that I have begotten you. And he says in another place, you are a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, that brings a figure that some of us may not be familiar with. Do you remember when, when Abraham was met by Melchizedek, the priest of Salem? Um, that was a prefigure, if you will, a foreshadowing of what was to come, that there would be a, a priest that would come that would be the intercessor between man and God. And it and I don't believe that it was a pre-incarnate uh, manifestation of Christ in the Old Testament, but I believe that Melchizedek was a foreshadow. And do you remember in the story what Melchizedek offered to Abraham? He offered Abraham bread and he offered him wine. A foreshadow of that Last Supper when Jesus Christ would offer bread and wine to his disciples and say, this is my body which is broken for you and my blood which was shed. So now Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek, uh, meaning that Melchizedek was the forerunner or the foreshadow of the one to come. Now in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to whom... Uh, who was able to save from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, let me sum these up for you. The writer says that the earthly priest had to first make atonement for their own sins. Jesus didn't have to make atonement for his own sins. So he's, he's greater than that earthly high priest because he was without sin himself. And he is after the order of Melchizedek, one who came from Salem. In those days, Jesus offered up, verse 7 again, prayer and supplications with loud voices and tears to him who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Now, this does in no way indicate that Jesus was disobedient and that he had to learn obedience. What, he, what, what the writer is saying is here is that Jesus became human flesh, fully God, fully man. And through the things he suffered, he learned, he walked out 
obedience in his life. He fulfilled what the first Adam was not able to fulfill. And in that, he was made complete or made a perfect sacrifice because he passed that test, if you will, of being fully man and tempted in every way we are, yet he was without sin and he was made complete. In other words, he was he in the flesh, in, in humanity, he fulfilled that which no other human being has ever fulfilled and that being perfectly obedient without sin. Therefore, he was the acceptable sacrifice for our sins. Well, I want to encourage you to take some time and read back through these verses in light of what we've shared this morning. Meditate on those, and I promise you, the more you meditate on these scriptures, the more your heart will be inclined to worship Jesus as the great high priest, the perfect sacrifice for your sins and my sins. And hopefully, as we meditate on that, we'll have greater um, freedom to come before the throne of God boldly, uh, without any reservation, knowing that we have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus and he forever makes intercession by his blood so that you and I can have access to the throne of God. Well, I pray the Lord blesses you today, that he keeps you. I want to encourage you. I want to ask you to please go ahead and share this on your Facebook feed. Let others know that this is available through Google, Apple, Spotify. Encourage others to get connected in the Word of God on a daily basis. I'm convinced that there are only two things that, that grow us, that sanctify us in the Christian life, and that is the Word of God by the Holy Spirit of God. We need the Holy Spirit of God, and we need the Word of God. It's not just black ink on white paper, but there is power because it is the very Word of God. Ask God to give you an opportunity today to plant a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart. If you recognize perhaps that the seed has already been planted there, that God would give you the wisdom, the discernment to know how to cultivate that seed that's been planted. And God, by his grace, if he would allow us to witness somebody be saved today, wouldn't that make our day? Let's pray and ask God to give us that opportunity. I love you. Look forward to being with you tomorrow morning. Have a great day.